This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. It's March, and I'm in the Great White North. The snow around us is blown into a giant cloud as the helicopter I'm crammed into lifts off. The pilot and the researcher I'm with decide on the flight plan. Would you like to cut straight to, like, Nestor 1 and down, or you uh, want to go no. through the willows? Up we'll go the... through the willows, and we'll go yeah. actually to the Cape. We're heading out to Cape Churchill, right on the western edge of Hudson Bay, in the northern part of the Canadian province of Manitoba. This is the subarctic, where boreal forest meets tundra, south touches north, and where sea ice meets land. I'm flying over the ice and it's really hard to describe, it's like a, a living bee in itself. Despite the hostile Arctic scene, we're actually nearly 500 miles south of the Arctic Circle. But it feels Arctic in every way because of the chilling effect of Hudson Bay, a massive body of water the size of Texas. And at this time of year, it's still frozen solid and home to hunting polar bears. The icy shapes are an incredible scene to take in. All these different formations, and some of them are the shapes of pancakes that have all jumbled together and frozen solid. And some of them look like volcanoes that have erupted under the ice. And then there's these it's approaching cracks. spring, and most of the polar bears in this population are below me on the ice, catching and eating as many seals as they can, quickly putting on fat before the bay melts in the summer and the seals disappear with it. This sea ice of Hudson Bay is what makes life possible here for polar bears. It's as important to them as the air they breathe. I mean, polar bears, their whole life history has evolved around sea ice. Everything they do is focused on, on the sea ice, and that's where they hunt seals. That's how they put on all their weight. Dr. Nick Lunn is a veteran polar bear biologist I've come to visit here. For the last 42 years, he's been studying this population of Hudson Bay polar bears and the impacts of climate change on the subarctic. We've all seen it, the image of a polar bear sitting on a slowly melting chunk of ice. It's almost become a cliche. It's that unseen thing happening in some place far, far away. But here, It is very real for every individual polar bear. Every year, hundreds of bears move through this area and they're forced to come ashore in the summer when the ice melts. A grueling annual migration that pushes the bears from ice to land and back to ice again. But people live here too, changing with the times alongside the bears, often right in their path. So I see bears not as friendly, but not scary, you know, and I think they're just trying to survive. And we happen to be in their way. We planted ourselves in their path that they took for millions of years, you know, and so we have to respect that. But there's one group of bears that's not on the ice. Right now, they're still on the land, cozy in their dens, nursing new tiny cubs, the mother polar bears. And right now, those families are about to start an epic springtime journey from the land to the sea ice, emerging from their snow-covered birth dens into a bewildering new world to join the other bears out on the frozen bay. The brutal life of any polar bear is astonishing, but the life of a new mother is an extraordinary tale of determination and grit against the forces of weather and time. Here, it's possible to watch how the changing seasons of our planet are shifting the traditions of the place, the polar bears, and the people of the North. These bears are the litmus test for all of it. Back up in the helicopter, the grand puzzle of this place begins to become clear. There's some tracks here. Oh, wow. Is that bear tracks? 
Yeah, looks like a female on one. Okay. Yeah, totally seeing them. Great. So what do you think the chances are of us finding this bear at the end of these tracks? I'm not going to say. <laughs> if I say, it won't happen. Okay. From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild. I'm sitting in a little plane on the runway in Winnipeg, Canada. The announcement over the speakers is in English, French, <laughs> and then an indigenous language of the north, Inuktitut. I'm heading to polar bear country, to a little town called Churchill, also known as the polar bear capital of the world. Winnipeg was cold, but stepping out of the plane in Churchill is a whole other level. Oh, that is biting cold. Yeah, you wouldn't want your earlobes out for very long in this. Population 900, Churchill sits where the Churchill River flows into Hudson Bay. You can only access it by plane or train. It's got a couple of small grocery stores, but no traffic lights, and there are more snowmobiles parked outside the houses than there are cars. It's long been an important strategic place for indigenous people, the Inuit, Dene, and Cree. And then in the 1600s, European hunters and trappers, and even the military in the 1960s. And it's also a strategic spot for polar bears, because Churchill is slap bang in the middle of their annual migration route. The polar bears of Hudson Bay around Churchill are the most southerly population in the world. That makes them very accessible to researchers. And even though Churchill is just a four hour flight from the big city of Winnipeg, it's a vast, wild area up here. And it includes a globally important maternal denning area for the bears on the land next to the bay. Part of it is Wapusk National Park. Wapusk means white bear in the local Cree language. It's the size of Yellowstone and Yosemite National Parks combined. Hundreds of dens are dug here by pregnant females every fall. I'm here in the early spring, a very special season indeed in the annual calendar of the polar bear, because it's now that the cubs emerge from their dens on land and see the world for the first time. I've come to join the research team that's monitoring them, and I hope to experience the first days of some of those cubs. I get a ride from the airport to the Northern Study Centre, 20 miles east of town. It's a field camp for researchers studying everything from Northern Lights to Caribou. It'll be my base camp for the next 10 days. Perfectly located, a short helicopter ride from the edge of the polar bear denning area and the sea ice. I step in from the cold. Oh, this place is huge. Like a space station in the subarctic. I'm directed down a hallway to Nick Lund's lab. The walls are covered with maps and posters of scientific research materials from the many scientists who spent time here. I'm looking for a Nick Lund. Oh! oh. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, it's been a number of years. Like over a decade. Is it? I can't even remember. (laughs) I I can't even remember. Nick is a long-time polar bear biologist working for the Wildlife Research Division of the Canadian government. Polar bears are monitored internationally and here in Canada as a species of special concern. Nick's also the co-chair of the Polar Bear Specialist Group, set up in the 1960s for specialists from each country that has polar bears. I first got connected with him through the bear world. He's somewhat of a legend because he's been doing this for so long. And he learned from Dr. Ian Sterling, a grandfather of early polar bear research. 
Nick was even featured in a documentary film I did called Bear Trek. So I'm excited to be up here with him again. Yeah, and we're just catching you just before you retire by the sound of things, eh? Yeah, this is my last spring. Wow, my last spring trip. After 40 plus years of capturing and monitoring polar bears, Nick is retiring. Only a handful of people outside his core team have ever been allowed to join him, and I'm going to be the last, so it's a real honour. Nick's work includes capturing bears to monitor their numbers and trends. That involves flying over the maternity denning area to look for bear tracks in the snow, capturing females and recording physiological data. He does all this to monitor health changes over many years to reveal patterns in the data. Oh yeah, and doing all of this in temperatures that can drop below minus 40. Celsius or Fahrenheit, they're the same at this point on the thermometer. It's an icy cold world that the polar bear is very much prepared for. But it's not always cold here. Every summer, the sea ice melts, forcing the bears ashore. And this provides an opportunity for researchers to monitor how this affects the bears. Nick tells me his science makes it clear big changes to Hudson Bay are coming down the pike. It's sort of like an early warning system, if you wish, to other places, right? Like, if in fact... You have this, this, what we're seeing here in Western Hudson Bay comes to pass in some of these other cells. These are the sorts of things that you should be prepared for, right? Doesn't mean they're happening now. In other words, what happens to the bears here is likely to happen to bears further north in the years to come. But for now, Nick says for some of those more northern bear populations, climate change might actually have a temporary benefit. It all has to do with different kinds of sea ice. There are generally two types of ice in the Arctic. You have multi-year ice and annual ice. Southern Hudson Bay, around Churchill, has annual ice, meaning every year, during the summer months, the ice completely melts away. It's called breakup. This freeze and thaw cycle is very pronounced this far south, and when the bay is frozen, it creates great habitat for seals and hunting polar bears. But further north, where temperatures are colder, the ice never fully melts. That's known as multi-year ice. This thicker ice is not ideal for seals and bears. So to Nick's point, as the north warms up, that thick multi-year ice will begin to thin, letting in more light, which supports more plankton, more fish, more open areas of water for seals, and more seals means more food for bears to eat. But this benefit from climate change north of here is only temporary because the polar bears up there will eventually experience what's happening right now in Hudson Bay, a quickening loss of ice and conditions that become unlivable for bears. Nick tells me when he started his work 40 years ago, there were 1,200 individuals in this western Hudson Bay population. Now, there are only 600 you know, when you see what's happening here, you, sh- you should be ready. Right? Yes, yes. You know? it, even if there is, uh, well, it's also an alarm bell for be ready, but also trying to avoid what is happening yeah. here, isn't it? Which might not be easy, but it all comes back to reversing or trying to halt climate change yeah, in some way. And, that, and that's the key, right? Like all yeah. these sorts of things are all related to this warming climate that is sort of getting away from us, right? And so we need to rein that in. After my brief reconnect with Nick, I lug all my gear upstairs to my sleeping quarters here at the Science Centre. It's a bit like being back in my dorm room. Number 11. Home sweet home. My Arctic nest for the next eight or nine days. Cool, what a view. Amazing. From my window, it's a classic northern scene. Small, snow-covered spruce trees, sparsely covering a flat landscape where I can see for miles, all the way to the frozen bay. I spot snowshoe hare tracks below my window. And where there are hares, wolf tracks outside. Oh, yeah, fantastic. They could just as easily be polar bear tracks. There's a very real possibility of bumping into one around here. So the centre has polar bear safety policies. You don't leave the place on foot. As I settle in, 
the low northern sun sets. And not long after, the northern lights start to dance above us. Churchill is known for its northern lights. Sometimes you can see them 300 nights a year here. The green curtains of light flow across the sky with a backdrop of stars. It's the perfect welcome. The next morning, I head downstairs to meet Nick to see if we'll be flying for bears in the helicopters today. The capture area, where the females are emerging with cubs, is on the land, just south of us, just a short flight away. Are you all caffeinated up? Oh, I'm never fully caffeinated up. (laughs) Just right about... I just, I I drink a lot. A lot here. Doesn't it go with the territory of being a government biologist? Uh, Watching the weather is a familiar routine to Nick, and it'll become one for me too this week. Wind chills this morning are too much for us right now. So we'll probably just sit and wait for a couple of hours and see if it improves. Today, it's too cold for us to do bear research. With the wind chill factor, it's minus 30 degrees Celsius, about minus 22 Fahrenheit. That's fine for the helicopters to operate, but not for handling any cubs we might capture. At only three months old, they don't have enough fat yet to help them regulate their body temperature. So Nick doesn't fly if it's colder than minus 30 Celsius. But that's the thing about the North. You always need a plan B. Life at the study centre can be kind of slow on a no-fly day. We kill time shooting pool. (laughs) Working out. Nick likes to play cribbage and talk about bears. We find a quiet place to talk about how he got started and some of the bear basics. How would you describe a polar bear? I I still uh, am amazed. When I first, I saw my first polar bear back in 1981. I got off an aircraft here in Churchill and we went straight in my street clothes and that time <laughs> to change. And they were impressive then. Uh, and this, and it was a sub-adult male, so it wasn't very big, but it was big, right, to me, having never seen one, and I'm still amazed. This was a three-year-old sub-adult male. Since that day, in 1981, Nick has been gathering data, capturing and tagging bears for 42 years. He's handled over 2,000 polar bears in his career, so he doesn't always remember individual bears. But I remember that one, and he was X05547. So that was his, his, his tag. I guess it is true what they say. You never forget your first. And I, I don't actually remember how big he was. I, I couldn't tell you the value, but just the sheer size seeing him <laughs> on the ground. And he was a young, he was a, you know, three-year-old polar bear. Mm-hmm. And he had been at the garbage dump, so he was very plump. He was probably fatter than he should be, right? But he had just been in the, in the Churchill garbage dump, but he was still an amazing animal to see. Just like their black bear cousins in towns across North America, polar bears were drawn to the dump just a few miles outside Churchill for easy calories until it was closed about 20 years ago. Because for a polar bear, the fatter you are, the more likely you are to survive breed, and give birth if you're a mum. Polar bears evolved from their close cousin, the grizzly brown bear, perhaps only in the last half a million years. But during that evolution, they grew much larger. A fully grown adult polar bear male can weigh 1,700 pounds and stand over 10 feet tall. Polar bears need seals to survive, and the seals need ice to survive, so polar bears and the seals they eat are susceptible even to the slightest temperature changes, because those tiny changes affect how much ice forms and how long it will last before melting in the summer. This is by far the best subpopulation anywhere in the world in which to study the impacts because it's 
got this continuous data set and it's so invaluable to have data going back to the 1980s and having ages of bears and being able to recapture the same bears over time. With this much data, you can start to pick out patterns. Nick discovered an amazing example of this in real time back in 1992. It was spring, like now, and he was counting and monitoring the health of the cubs and their numbers. Doing this gives an accurate representation of how the population of bears is doing as a whole. Well, in 1992, Nick counted more cubs than he was expecting to see. And it turns out, the year before, in 1991, temperatures were cooler all around the world, and especially here in the subarctic. In fact, the temperatures were so much cooler, the sea ice melted, broke up, much later than normal that summer. Nick dug a little deeper. So when we started looking at the data, we started talking with climatologists and stuff, and they sort of put us on to Mount Pinatubo which was a, a volcano in the Philippines that erupted in 1991. What's a volcano got to do with polar bear cubs? Nick started looking to how the eruption had affected weather. The volcano explosion was massive and put a lot of particulate matter into the atmosphere. More ash, gases and particles into the air than from any volcano in over a hundred years. Amazingly, this reduced the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth. Which cooled the Arctic. And so the breakup in 1992 was much later than it had been previously. What? So these bears that were born in 1992 had their mothers were out on the sea ice longer, came ashore much, much fatter, and were able to put that energy into these cubs. The cubs were much bigger than they would have been, right, normally. That's so incredible. all those things sort of said, yeah, you can't pick up little tiny blips, but Mount Pinatubo was a huge blip, <laughs> right? right? That's and amazing. you could pick it up, an environmental change uh, of well, that magnitude in polar bears, which are, you know, from wherever Mount Pinatubo is, however many thousands of kilometers. And it's a crazy thought that a volcano kind of like momentarily reversed climate change. That, that so yeah, <laughs> things that happen halfway around the world have an impact here. Yeah. And vice versa, things that we do here have impacts on the other side of the world. The evidence was starting to build that the weather, climate, was very directly affecting the polar bear's ability to survive. Mount Pinatubo had provided a really dramatic pulse on the graph to highlight it. Nick was among the first researchers in the north to ring the alarm bell about climate change. Back in the late 90s when we started making the links between sea ice breakup and the impacts on polar bear populations here, I thought, finally, we sort of have the smoking gun. Now we have a concrete example that we can put out there and show people that, yes, the things that are sort of more up there in the atmosphere that people couldn't really grasp, here's a real example of what this means. Here it is. And nothing happened. He was on the front line, and the data was clear to him. A warming Arctic would have major impacts across the globe. He was seeing it with the bears he was studying. But even though the western Hudson Bay polar bears were pointing to the smoking gun, real evidence for climate change back then. Frustratingly, it took many more years for it to be taken seriously. And Nick's research is still critical, connecting the dots between a warming planet, melting sea ice, and the deteriorating health of his bears. After the break, we explore how the changing seasons affect not just the bears of Churchill, but the people who live here too. And a change in the weather finally allows us to jump into the helicopters to search for those new mother polar bears and their cubs. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. 
We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. The next morning, the weather has warmed up a bit. But now the problem is the clouds and snow. It is not looking very good for flying. Overcast skies, snow, so the light's flat. It's going to be hard to track from a safety perspective. All right, Nick tells me it's one of the most dangerous situations for a helicopter. When the sky and land look the same, there's no horizon. The pilot can't tell what's up and what's down. He's lost more than one polar bear colleague to helicopter accidents because of this. I'm starting to feel a bit like the mother bears playing a waiting game, waiting for the weather. But it allows me some time to head towards town. I rent an old Nissan Pathfinder to go and meet some locals and explore the edge of the sea ice along the way. But first, I need to layer up. Nice, thick, long johns. When it's minus 30 outside, it takes a lot to stay warm. Face mask for the real biting wind. Put that around my face. This kind of cold cuts right through. Not like regular cold, but like a steely blade. Skin freezes in minutes. And if you're not dressed properly, there's a very real threat of hypothermia taking hold after just 20 minutes. Insulated coveralls. Seven layers up top. Three pairs of gloves. I've even got heated socks. This is when things start getting really warm. Think about how a polar bear gets the same result with a layer of fat and a thick coat of hollow hairs to help insulation. All my layers make getting behind the steering wheel a bit of a task. The Michelin man could probably squeeze in faster. Oh yes, it's a relief when it starts. When it's minus 30, you can never be too sure. The road is wild and snow-blown. Icy crystals whip across the surface in beautiful, delicate waves. And all around are trees bent and stunted by the arctic winds that shape this place. As I slow down to round a bend, Hudson Bay suddenly looms in front of me. It's 650 miles to the other side of it. And right now, in spring, It's calling the new mother polar bears, beckoning them out from their winter dens where they've been since the fall. They gave birth in December, and now they're beginning their migration with their cubs from land to the ice in front of me, where they too will finally get to hunt. Oh, wow, chilly wind. I walk out to the windy beach and look over the thick jumbled ice. It's like standing on the edge of two worlds. To my left is their habitat where they've been denning for the last few months and given birth. And to my right is this sea ice where all the other bears are. And that's where the females with new cubs want to be. And uh, it's really cool to think about them starting to make their way out there at this time of year with those little tiny youngsters unimaginable what those youngsters face in their first weeks of life out of the den. For many humans though, the most important season is not winter or spring, but fall. Ah, the tundra buggy. <laughs> I spent a lot of time trundling around on one of these things. A bit further down the coast, at the side of the road, I've spotted something from my past. So these are the buggies that the tourists come and uh, look for bears in with, with guides like me at the time. It's called a tundra buggy, designed to carry tourists safely out onto the tundra to look for bears. And starting in the late 90s, I worked on them every October for 10 years as a bear guide. Tourism is an essential part of life here in Churchill. Thousands of tourists flock here over a few short weeks in the fall because it's then that the bears are gathering. It's a key time for them as they've been stuck on land all summer with no sea ice to hunt on. The whole bay melts in the summer. But in October, it starts to freeze again. And the bears want to be on that ice. So they gather right here, not far from town, in a place where the ice begins to form first. And there are people in Churchill who've made tourism their livelihood. It seems like everyone in town is in some way 
woven into the seasonal influx of tourists, finding ways to make a living while the going is good. Like Dave Daly, fascinating guy I meet on the way into town. How long have you been dog mushing, Dave? Oh, well, you know, I grew up in Churchill in the 60s and the 70s, eh? And uh, and there's always dog teams around. But my own dog team, probably since 2000, 2001. <laughs> oh, you are delightful. Dave's a pretty famous dog musher. He's done some epic trips, sometimes across hundreds of miles. Now he takes tourists out to experience an Arctic sled ride with his dog teams through his company called Wapusk Adventures. He's Métis. He has a mixed background of European and indigenous First Nations. He shows people around on dog sleds as part of what he calls the indigenous tourism experience. You know, it wasn't always popular to be indigenous. You know, and as uh, the indigenous, uh, the plight of the indigenous people has has uh, has uh, come to the forefront, and especially indigenous spirituality with Mother Earth and about all global warming and all this stuff. You know, it's 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 uh, becoming quite popular to be indigenous nowadays, and we're going to feed off of that in the tourism industry. And so there's not much uh, economic driver in a lot of indigenous communities, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, but we have a really rich uh, uh, lifestyle that people want to come and experience. Along with his dog sled company, he also owns a general store. He wears multiple hats in this tight-knit community. But he's constantly aware of his vicinity to the bears. Living with bears is just a part of life for people in Churchill. Murals of bears are painted on buildings around town. A garage door with a polar bear face. A psychedelic polar bear drawn up of different geometric shapes. I had a mother and cubs camp out here behind my teepee, fresh out of the den one year. Wow. You know, I've had bears sleeping beside dog houses when I walk into my kennel, you know. Like, polar bears are just a, a fact of life around here. And they're to be given a wide berth. You know, they're the biggest lamb carnivore on the planet. You know, we're meat. They eat meat. And because the bears are stuck on land for an increasingly longer period of time each year, the chances of people and bears running into each other only increases. There's even a brochure about a polar bear alert program that has some choice bits of advice to help avoid conflicts. Do not carry food while walking outside. Stay close to your vehicle. Back away, facing the polar bear at all times. Do not run away. Do not play dead. I think we've had a pretty good relationship with the bears. You know, like if you don't bother them, they're not going to bother you. So we're always like an owl looking all around whenever we're walking. Georgina Berg is a local member of the indigenous Cree nation. She lives a little further down the road on the edge of town. She's lived here her whole life. The Cree shared this land with Inuit and Dene people long before white settlers arrived. There's a crackling fire to warm up her small one-bedroom cabin. Georgina says encounters with bears in town are rare, but during the fall, a bear can literally be around any corner, behind any building. She says that the bears are always living up in their heads around here. And I don't think they look at a human and say, I want to eat that, because I think we're like Brussels sprouts to them, because we don't taste very good to them. They like seals. So they're going to put every effort and save their energy for possibly seeing a seal. But in the summer and fall, with no sea ice, there's no access to seals, so the bears are waiting, killing their time, in a kind of walking hibernation, not eating, all around Churchill and sometimes right in town. And then, um, and then in the fall, they're migrating. They're migrating uh, and trying to get their way back to the sea ice. And that's changing. Like it used to be, it used to be by October 31st, the Hudson Bay was frozen over and the bears were on their way to ne- their next migration spot. But now, It's like December 10th and the the water is still open. Here's why. Usually, the bay slowly starts to freeze by around November, and it happens close to Churchill first. The current of the giant Texas-sized bay moves 
anti-clockwise. And as ice starts to form further north, it accumulates. It sort of builds up on a huge ledge of land that juts out from town. Plus, fresh water flows into the bay here from the Churchill River, and that fresh water freezes before the salty seawater. That's why the bears are gathering here. Because once the ice forms enough for the bears to walk and hunt on it, they're gone. And the town can breathe easy, let their guard down a bit. But because of climate change, on average, that freeze-up is happening later and later. And it's extra noticeable on one particular night in the fall. So in all of my years living here in Churchill, Halloween has been a really interesting day. Georgina says it's always a tense night, you know, with kids trick-or-treating in a town that sits in the middle of a population of hungry polar bears. The children pour onto the icy streets and the whole town rallies to keep them safe. Fire trucks, ambulances, police, anybody that's got a siren lines up around the outskirts of town. And watch and make sure no bears are wandering into the town. And they do the sirens and the lights and the fire trucks. They make all kinds of noise. And they do this till about 9 p.m. And then at 9 p.m., all the children are to stop trick-or-treating and all the services go back to where they... (laughs) (laughs) So it's quite interesting. The danger is very real. Hundreds of polar bears migrate past and around the Churchill area every fall. The last serious attack was in 2013, about 10 years ago. On Halloween night, two people were seriously injured when they were attacked by a bear. Two bears were killed as a result. It's surprising that it doesn't happen more often. Georgina is part of an indigenous group in town known as the Knowledge Keepers. The roots of her people are steeped in the land here, the ice, the bears, and the ancient languages that tie them all together. As a child, she was made to feel shameful because she couldn't speak English. Now she works with kids and youth to remind them of their place here in this demanding landscape. And so this is my uh, mission right now, is to, to teach the youth to hold up their heads and be proud, you know, and, and learn about the history of our people, because our people, our ancestors, were very resilient and strong and proud, you know, and they worked really hard, you know, to settle this land that we've come to, you know. My producer Matt leans in to ask a question. What lessons do you think we can learn from the polar bear? I think polar bears are the major reminders of global warming. To take care of our earth, you know, like quit messing around with it already because they're the ones that are going to be suffering. And in no time, that might be us. You know, they might be trying to tell us something. And there's so much... uh, respect that needs to come from uh, that animal you know they they um, they teach us respect and uh, we need to show that respect back The next morning, day four, and suddenly it's all hands on deck. The clouds have cleared, it's warmed up a bit, the weather is finally good, so it's time to fly. We gear up fast, and two helicopters arrive from town. They circle down to pick us up. Okay, everybody's buckled in, ready to go. Yep, all set in the back. As we lift off, everything falls into perspective. I see the line where the land meets the frozen bay, the Arctic tundra stretching north and the trees to the south. And that's where we're heading, to the forested denning area in and around Wapusk National Park to search for bears. These new family groups are the only bears in this area and they're just emerging from their dens with tiny new cubs. When the ice froze in the winter, they were the only ones to stay behind on land. So the way to find them is to search for their tracks in the snow and follow them. But there are tracks from caribou and wolves too, so differentiating them from up here is not easy. And the landscape is massive. The 
anticipation is high. We fly for about 30 minutes of searching when Nick's assistant Dave spots something. Oh, old track. Was that a track? Maybe there were some older ones, I think. Let's go back and at least have a look. Okay. Where did you see them? They're a little bit back now. Okay. The helicopter makes a banking turn to the left to follow the tracks, and I squint to try and see them. Still see it there, Nick? Uh, they're going off. Uh, we're crossing them now. They're right off our nose. Oh, yep, got it. There it is, right in front of us. <laughs> yeah, running. Single bear. There it is, a bear running through the deep snow about a quarter mile away. The next steps are crucial to minimize stress to the bear and her cubs and keep everyone safe. The helicopter drops Nick and I off a half mile from the bear to make the helicopter lighter and more maneuverable. Then, hovering over the female bear, Dave leans through the window, fires a tranquilizer dart from a rifle, and the helicopter backs away quickly to let her fall asleep. The drug has worked, and the bear is lying in the snow. We've landed 50 yards away, and Nick and I approach her quietly on foot. But surprisingly, there are no cubs to be seen. She's alone. I kneel next to her to take a closer look. She's magnificent. Her coat is more yellow than white. It's glistening in the bright sunlight. Her huge, furred paws are as big as dinner plates. She's breathing heavily, but the anesthetic is calming her. Her breath is warm. It's okay, uh, you take a big breath. She's a beautiful female. She's just under the drug now. The guys are just about to start taking a couple of samples. And she has no cubs. She's on her own out here. It's very unusual that this female is alone here in the Denning area. It brings up a lot of questions. Healthy looking female. She looks healthy, yeah. I'm surprised she doesn't have cubs. Well, it doesn't, uh, I mean, we won't know till we examine her, but yeah. certainly there was a den site and there were no cub tracks around, it's just hers. Nick and his team quickly go to work. Their goal is to make this as smooth and stress-free as possible for the bear and the team. From the tip of her nose to the last, to the tip of the last bone in the tail. Yep. Okay, okay. 190 for straight line. In the same way Nick has done for 40 years here, they measure body length check for ear tags in case the bear has been previously captured. The data they collect will continue to build a picture of change. So it doesn't look like she had cubs? Okay. Yeah. So uh, what on earth is she doing here? Well, she would have gone into the den in the fall time, presumably. Yeah. So either she lost them in the den, she had cubs and they didn't make it, or... She never had cubs, but it'd be odd that she'd still be here. So my guess is she probably had cubs, might have had one in the den, yeah. and has come out and the, the cub has not survived. It's hard to know. Nick will probably never know what happened to this female's cubs. There are some things in nature that no amount of data will explain. Incredibly, like all new polar bear mothers here on the land, she has not eaten since she last had access to seals on the sea ice. That was eight months ago. It all comes down to the fascinating and quite unbelievable energetics of these bears. How they deal with feast followed by famine every year. What these new mothers go through is like a monumental physiological miracle. And giving birth is just the beginning of it. As we lift off away from her, I think about that. The successes and failures of the one life she's living as an individual bear, fighting for survival every year as the seasons, the ice and the seals come and go. And as the summers are getting longer, things are becoming more difficult for the bears. As the temperatures rise, will there be enough ice to sustain this population? On the next episode of The Wild, how they tackle the boom and bust of food availability, calorie counting for polar bears, and our search for those tiny teddy bear-sized cubs 
finally pays off as we follow the seasonal cycle of the Hudson Bay polar bears. If you want to see some incredible imagery of polar bears and the scene and my time up in Hudson Bay, we've made a short behind-the-scenes film to share with you, produced by Paul Bikis. There's a link in our show notes. And as always, there are some great photographs and clips on Instagram at The Wild Pod and mine at Chris Morgan Wildlife. The Wild is inspired not just by nature, but by the people who work in it, love it, protect it. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producers are Matt Martin and Lucy Suchek. Jim Gates is our editor. A huge thank you to the Isdell Family Foundation, who provided a grant to make this episode possible. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Paul Lister, Mark Wilkins and Rebecca Badger, Bob Yellowlees, Barbara Stolman, and Annie Mize. Our production team includes Paul Bikis, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Michaela Ginotti Boyle, Tatiana Latre, Kyra McDermott, Darcy Riggan Schmidt, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm Chris Morgan. I hope you're enjoying season five of The Wild. Share it with others if you can. You might just inspire someone to connect with nature in a beautiful way. Thanks so much for listening.